Hi, a warm welcome to everyone. I am Dr. Madhu Raju from Srikaran Institute of Ophthalmology, Kakinada, India. I hope all of you are doing good and keeping safe during this pandemic. It is my pleasure to interact with all of you in this prestigious learning platform from Orbis CyberSight. In the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll be covering the topic of microbial keratitis, making it relevant and also as an update for the general ophthalmologists in their day-to-day -day practice. So as you can see here in the background of my first slide, I come from one of the rice bowls of India, that's the Godavari Delta, where we have lush green fields and coconut fields around us. In this beautiful fields, also there is lurking fungus that affects most of our patients during the reaping season. So I have no financial disclosures in any of the topics that I'm going to speak in this webinar. So the webinar, I would be covering it under the following headings. First of all, we'll start off with a pre-test to test your existing knowledge that you have right now. And we'll tell you the answers at the end of the sessions. Next, I'll discuss about the background burden and causes of microbial keratitis. Next, we'll discuss about the clinical diagnosis. How can you clinically diagnose different forms of microbial keratitis and how you can differentiate it from other forms. And then we'll touch upon the role of microbiological evaluation and confocal microscopy. Then we'll see the medical management, both empirical and specific therapies. We'll briefly touch upon the landmark trials in microbial keratitis like mud and skirt from the Arvind group. And also we'll see the role of intrastromal injections and cross-linking in infectious keratitis. Finally, we'll see the surgical intervention starting from tissue adhesives with bandage contact lens, patch grafts, and finally therapeutic grafts. We'll end off the session with the take home message and a post test to see how much knowledge you have gained through this webinar. So without any delay, let us start the pre-test questions. I have five pre-test questions for you. So the first question is, over-the-counter steroids are the most important cause for, or the most common cause for, A, bacterial keratitis, B, allergic conjunctivitis, C, fungal keratitis, D, both B and C. Yeah, let's go to the next question. I'll reveal the answers in the end of the session. Which bacterial organism causes rapid progression and corneal melting? A, Staphylococcus, B, Pseudomonas, C, Streptococcus, D, Nocardia. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. When should we refer a case of microbial keratitis to our cornea colleagues for management? A, when the ulcer size is more than three millimeters. B, when the ulcers are in the central axis obscuring the vision. C, one-eyed patients and children. D, all of the above. Thank you. Fourth question. What is the indication for a therapeutic keratoplasty or surgical intervention in microbial keratitis? A, impending corneal perforation. B, limbal involvement. C, deep stromal ulcers not responding to maximal medical therapy. D, all of the above. Thank you. So let's go to the last question. Steroids should be avoided in which form of viral keratitis? Non-necrotizing stromal keratitis, B, disciform endothelitis, C, epithelial form of the disease like dendrites, D, both 
options A and B. Thank you. So I think 50 to 60% of you have answered right to all the questions. So by the end of the session, I would like to see at least 90% of you answering the questions correctly. So let us go to the background of microbial keratitis. So every year around the world, we see around 1.5 to 2 million new cases of microbial keratitis that come up. And they also amount nearly to 5% of the total blindness caused by trauma and its consequent infection. And the burden of this infection in the US alone is 175 million US dollars direct as direct expenditure and an additional 70 million US dollars on Medicare or Medi-Aid per year. That is how problematic this disease can be. And when you go into finer details, the fungal keratitis, the outcomes are more poorer when you compare to other forms of keratitis. It has almost five times more higher perforation rate when you compare it with bacterial. And also the surgical intervention is nearly 30% in all the cases. And the treatment cost also is three times more when you compare it with other form of microbial keratitis. Throughout our network hospital in Sri Kiran, we see around three to four new cases every day. So with this experience, I'm, I'll be sharing with you uh, what, whatever we have seen in the past and how you can easily differentiate clinically uh, between different organisms just by looking and having a meticulous slit lamp examination. And one more important thing that all of us should keep in mind when you're treating microbial keratitis is the emergence of antibiotic resistance that is throwing a challenge for all of us in the management of this dreaded disease. So if you see the causative organisms, there is a whole list of organisms that can cause microbial keratitis, starting from fungus, from bacteria that can be gram-positive, gram-negative, or atypical mycobacteria. Then you have acanthamoeba, that's a parasite. Then you have nocard nocardia, that's a filamentous bacteria. Then you have microsporidia, pythium, and then you can have a combination of any of these that is polymicrobial. Usually I don't cover viral in my talks, but uh, from the pre-registered delegates feedback that I got, I tried to cover the HSV keratitis also in a brief way for the sake of the audience that have asked me yesterday. So coming to Microbial keratitis, the two major forms of microbial keratitis that we see in the developing world are fungal and bacterial keratitis. So if you are able to differentiate between fungal and bacterial keratitis clinically, half your job is done. And as the classical teaching goes, the fungal uh, lesions, are set, they are irregular, they have serrated margins, and they have a raised profile over the cornea. Whereas the bacterial lesions have more well-defined margins and they have a flatter profile. And when it comes to color, the bacterial keratitis has a more whitish hue, whereas fungal keratitis has a more of yellowish tinge to it. And apart from this clinical aspect, you should always take the history into consideration. For example, you are practicing in a rural area and the patient gives you a history of trauma with vegetative matter and our history of use of steroid use, all these things are more inclining towards fungal keratitis. Whereas you're practicing in a semi-urban or a city area, then more likely that you're going to see bacterial keratitis because of contact lens wear or trauma from non-vegetative matter. So this is how you can differentiate. If you see these pictures, wherever the borders are irregular, the lesion is raised and it has an yellowish tin, it is more likely to be fungal. Wherever the lesions are more well-defined, the surface is flatter and it has a whitish hue to it, it is more likely to be bacterial. So with this introduction, let us go into fungal keratitis in detail. As we see, 80% of the cases that we see in our routine practice are fungal keratitis. So I'd like to stress upon it more, especially in developing countries. So if you see here, there are two dangerous combinations in fungal keratitis. One, most of our population are dependent on agriculture and they work day in and day out in the fields. 
where they are prone to trauma with vegetative matter. Once this trauma occurs, the second bad thing that happens to them is they either go to a nearest medical shop where in India, unfortunately, over-the-counter steroids are freely available, or sometimes they even take the steroid drops that we give post-operatively after cataract to them or their family members. So for any redness or any itching or any irritation in the eye, they go back to this post-operative drops we give them and they use it throughout the family. And this combination of a vegetative matter trauma and use of steroids gives rise to a very fulminant form of fungal keratitis that you can see in the picture here that almost will not heal to medical therapy and obviously you have to go in for a large therapeutic grafts and the outcomes as you know are very poor. And also the ulcers we see have a seasonal variation to them over here. So whenever there is the reaping of paddy we tend to see more trauma and then we have this crop of ulcers also coming along with it. So it depends also where you are practicing. For example in India, in southern part of India, fusarium is more common. Whereas in the north and eastern part, aspergillus is more common. Candida or infection in yeast, we see very rarely in our country. It is usually seen in immunocompromised individuals. So let us see the early signs of fungal keratitis. If the patient is lucky enough, he may present to you with this kind of a picture. So if you see the first two pictures, they can easily mimic a dendritic ulcer. So you have to be very careful in examining these ulcers. So how do you differentiate between a dendritic ulcer and an early fungal keratitis? You have to look for this end bulbs. You have to look for this central ulceration. Typically in a HSV keratitic dendrite, the surrounding stroma will not be very hazy. It will be relatively clear. Whereas in case of a fungal keratitis, if you see the surrounding stromal haze, is definitely pathognomic of a fungal origin. And also, when you elicit the history properly, they'll always give you a trauma history with a vegetative matter, which you should have more inclination towards a fungal keratitis. And the third picture here, sometimes the patient can present to you in a healing phase. In this phase, this particular lesion can mimic a geographic ulcer of viral keratitis again. Here again, what you have to differentiate is see for signs of inflammation. Obviously, when it is a healing ulcer, you don't see any congestion like this in this picture. If it is a viral geographic ulcer, you'll definitely see a lot of uh, congestion that is there and the lid edema that accompanies it. So in the early forms of fungal keratitis, always try to differentiate it from the dendrite of the uh, HSV. And there is no harm in debriding both the lesions. If it is HSV, debridement is known to be a useful tool. In the same way, if it is a fungal keratitis, with your debridement, you are taking off the load of the fungal organisms from the cornea. So next is the classical picture that usually presents to us after the patient undergoes treatment with a local uh, a medical shop or a RMP that is practicing near his village. So here you can see this typical textbook like appearance like feathery margins that you see in the picture here. Then you have satellite lesions that you can see in the picture down here. Sometimes you can see this superficial plaque pigmented kind of thing. This is pathognomic of a fungal infection with dermatitious fungi. Please remember that whenever you see this pigmented lesion that is like spread like a carpet over the cornea, always try to scrape it out with a 15 number blade once an edge is raised and the either side you can just catch that edge with a fine toothed forceps and you can nicely peel off this entire plaque believe me when you peel off this entire plaque the cornea almost clears up and until unless you do this plaque removal or therapeutic debridement the drug won't penetrate and the ulcer will just be like that over the surface and it will start spreading like a carpet. So whenever you see this pigmented lesions, carpet-like lesions, try to lift one edge with help of a blade and then gently pull it out with help of a fine toothed forceps. And next coming to 
Anterior stromal infections in fungal keratitis can mostly be caused by fusarium. And when they are more deeper, they're more likely to be caused by aspergillus. So these are the things you have to remember when you see classical picture. Anterior stromal, more likely to be from fusarium. Uh, dermatitious fungi, therapeutic debridement is more important. Otherwise, your drugs will not work. Aspergillus, these are more deeper infections that will require a modification in the treatment that we'll discuss in the treatment part. So this is the advanced stage of fungal keratitis. So if you see this advanced stage of fungal keratitis, you can see this deep endothelial plaques, abscess formation. And in second picture, you can clearly see the limbal involvement. And the picture over here, it is a frank corneal perforation with the PCI oil that is extruding through it. So these are all the advanced cases that would probably require a therapeutic graft. So coming to the microbiological diagnosis, if you have access to them, a simple KOH mount will beautifully show these fungal filaments that are there. And in gram stain, they'll stand out like this. And this is how a fungal growth will look like on potato dextrose agar growth. And these are the fungal filaments in in vivo confocal microscopy. So if you don't have access to it, don't worry. With the help of the clinical signs that I have told you, try to see, look for those signs and start the treatment. So what is the role of in vivo confocal microscopy in fungal keratitis? So wherever the lesions are scrapable, they are in the anterior stroma and you can scrape these lesions, there is no role for fungal care, in vivo confocal microscopy. So these are lesions which are not scrapable, that are mostly deeper lesions in the deeper stroma. Or for example, you can take this tunnel infiltrate. If you can see the corneal slit is clear, but from the inner lip of the tunnel, this cottony growth is extending into the anterior chamber. And in this anterior chamber, if you see, those are the fungal filaments you can beautifully appreciate. So if you can see the depth at which this confocal scan was taken is 834 microns. As all of you know, almost at 500 to 550, the corneal endothelium ends. And now the scan that we are taking is in the AC and without doing any microbiology, if you have access to confo scan, you can easily uh, I identify these organisms with help of this wonderful equipment. So a going a step ahead, if you have access to confocal microscopy and the lesions are not scrapable, you can also try to speciate the fungus. For example, if it, the fungus is having branches at right angles, it is more likely that it is fusarium. And if the fungus has dichotomous branching with branching at 45 degrees, it is more likely to be aspergillus. You can see the comparison here. If you see here, aspergillus is more arborizing. It is more dichotomous and 45 degrees branching. Whereas in uh, fusarium, the branching is more right angular. Okay, so that is how you can differentiate in uh, in vivo confocal microscopy. This may not hold good when you're looking at broken filaments because you don't exactly know which kind of fungus you are looking at. Especially when you're looking at healing ulcers, you may not get a correct idea, but when you're looking at an active deep ulcer with endoexidate, you can get a cue most of the times of which kind of fungus you're looking at also. So the treatment for fungal keratitis, we follow the modified TST protocol. That is the topical, systemic, and targeted therapy that was uh, recommended by RP Center Ames that we have modified it to our needs. So what we do is like in filamentous fungi, like fusarium and all, we start off with natamycin 5% eye drops one hourly during waking time. And if it is aspergillus, we add voriconazole. One important take home message from our much study is never use voriconazole as a monotherapy. Always use it in combination with a natamycin or any other antifungal. Because in the study, they have found out that the group in which they have used voriconazole as a monotherapy, the perforation rate was higher. For the nighttime cover, we give itraconazole eye ointment and symptomatic relief, we treat with the atropine, analgesics, anti-glaucoma medication. One more important point I would like to make here is we have done a randomized control trial to see the role of oral doxycycline for its anti-MMP activity in prevention of perforation and surgical intervention in fungal keratitis. And our results have been that in the 
group which we used oral doxycycline the results were better and statistically significant lesser perforations and therapeutic grafts were done in that group we are shortly going to publish this study it is in the process of publication so systemic ketoconazole we usually add in case of deeper ulcers it is usually ketoconazole 200 mg twice a day for two weeks and uh, we keep monitoring the liver function tests as we keep continuing the dose systemically for candida as i have told you amphotericin b is a drug of choice along with that you can add voriconazole or natomycin usually it is seen in immunocompromised individuals uh, intrastromal and intracameral injections i'll show you a short video our experience with is limited but however the group from rp centers have told that the results are good with these injections and uh, our own colleague dr sivaram krishna has done a study in which he has found that instead of waiting for longer time and less letting the ulcer to worsen if you can do an early tpk using an optical tissue the results are far better and once you things are under control you can even start steroids post operatively with caution and slowly salvage the same tpk graft into an optical graft and one more important thing is cross linking should never be done for fungal keratitis i was uh, one of the investigators during my fellowship period at arvind so we found that cross linking did not have any beneficial role in advanced fungal keratitis actually the perforation rate was higher in the group in which we were doing fungal keratitis what we found out later was probably because of cross linking we are making the stroma compact that the antifungals are not reaching the uh, disease and after that they have done one more study in uh, arvin that is the clare study that tells that even as a primary therapy also in fungal keratitis cross linking does not have any role one new thing that uh, we can look for in future is the role of tacrolimus for its anti inflammatory properties in animal studies it has been shown to have beneficial role and it acts synergistically with voriconazole and natamycin in the treatment of fungal keratitis so with this protocol we are able to achieve 75 healing in 75% of our cases so you may be wondering why we are achieving these results there are two reasons for these results one is when you are giving specific therapy instead of empirical therapy for fungal ulcers you have better drug compliance you are not diluting your drugs with antibiotics second the commensal bacteria which are there within the conjunctiva and lid margins they actually act against the fungus when you are giving antibiotics indiscriminately you are taking away this beneficial role from your body so this is the reason when we give very specific antifungal therapy the healing almost is there in 75% of our cases so let's see the intrastromal injection so in this intrastromal injection if you can see so this is an abscess that is there in the graft host junction so this is again a scraping showed uh, aspergillus fungus and culture was showed aspergillus we are trying to so whenever there is an abscess never try to give an intrastromal injection directly it will not be of any use so first you have to drain the abscess that is what we are trying to do in this video with help of a fine needle so as you can see the pus is very thick we are unable to drain it with the needle so we what we have done is now we have removed the needle and with help of the tuberculin syringe we have just aspirated the entire abscess now that the abscess is cleared you can gently go into the stroma 365 degrees and start injecting your intrastromal voriconazole in the area of the lesion if you see in this area there is some infiltrate that is still there so i'm just giving it adjacent to that area so that the drug will work better so the most important thing with intrastromal injections is a single injection in most of the times may not suffice you may need to give multiple injections and after multiple injections these organisms will start responding and always try to give 360 degrees in the uh, lesion and never use it as a monotherapy use it as an adjuvant therapy to your topical therapy so next see let us see uh, the next case where suppose the grafts are 
the perforation is not in the center, then we can do patch grafts that are four to five millimeter. When you do this patch graph, you have to make sure that you clear the angle. If you see that angle I'm saying there, you can see that endo exudates that are adherent to the iris. You have to make sure that you release all those adhesions and you clean that angle before you close it up. So this later can be taken up for an optical graft. But when you do this, you are saving a lot of endothelium instead of doing a large graft. Here again, you can see a full thickness thing that is again in the periphery. Again, it is involving the limbus in the periphery. So this is a perforation again in the periphery with active lesion inferiorly. So again here, you just take that part. You don't go for the entire cornea and then later plan for an optical graft. So tunnel infiltrates also, you can plan in this kind of a technique. So now let us see a total corneal graft. If you see a total corneal graft, it's something like this. There is nothing that you need to refine here. It's more like a freehand dissection. So you gently remove the ulcer. It's almost a full thickness thing and the entire limbus is involved. You can see that I have removed the entire cornea. Now you can see those plaques that are there in the anterior chamber with gentle use of uh, saline, you remove these plaques and then place the corneal button. And these large buttons obviously in long term will develop glaucoma and will requ requ require a glaucoma drainage device. And uh, you should be using uh, 90 sutures instead of 10 0 here, the burying becomes difficult. But always give it a chance, never lose hope because sometimes these grafts will survive and with secondary procedures, you can also turn them into vision saving things. So now that we have finished fungal keratitis, let us go to a disease that mimics this fungal keratitis closely. That is Pythium keratitis. So if you see in this Pythium, there are two things that will differentiate Pythium from fungal keratitis. One is this tentacular projections that come out from the main lesion and a peripheral gutter, just like PUK, that you can see in these cases. So these are again a series of cases produced from our alma mater, Arvind, where you can easily see. And in history, you'll have a history of water exposure. And in usually rainy seasons, you tend to see this Pythium more. So two lesions that you should remember are tentacle-like projections and a peripheral gutter. When you see these lesions, have a high suspicion for fungal keratitis. And most of the times when you mistake this as fungal keratitis, and when you are giving antifungal therapy, when you see that the, it is not responding to it, that is the time when you have to reassess again, go back and do the scraping again, and look for pythium in particular. So this is how a pythium will look like in a gram stain. If you see it is more ribbon-like, it will not have septae like you have seen in the fungal hyphae. And its walls are also relatively thicker. And when you see in blood cultures, you have this juice pores that are there. So this is how you differentiate microbiologically between a fungus and pythium. And the pythium management has not been standardized, but the group from LVP by Dr. Bhupesh Bagga, they have recommended the use of topical linozolate that is one hourly and uh, oral azithromycin. In Aravind, we also add topical antifungals to it like itraconazole, oriconazole, or econazole, and also topical azithromycin that is available in ointment form. But however, we have seen that only 30 to 50% of our cases heal to medical therapy, and most of them have very poor prognosis, especially if it is pythium. It is a very invasive disease. We have a case report from RP Center where it has gone into a, the uh, uh, gone for a cranial involvement even death has occurred so in these cases you should be prepared for a therapeutic graft evisceration or enucleation however we need more data to have a standardized protocol for this particular disease so next let us go to bacterial keratitis so in bacterial first we'll cover gram positive so gram positive are usually because of your Staph aureus or staph epidermis or streptococcus that are there as commensals in your ocular adenexa. 
So these infections are usually well-defined and superficial. However large they may be, they'll always be well-defined. And they usually uh, heal well to antibiotics. And when it's gram negative, especially pseudomonas, it worsens within hours. If you see this picture here, it's almost like within one day that it has turned from this into this. And your suspicion should always be high for pseudomonas if it is turning worse overnight. And if the patient is a contact lens wearer, and here the inflammatory component is more than the infectious component. That is why you see this pathognomic worsening, rapid worsening and corneal melting that is very, very classical of pseudomonas. So these are the, if you see GPC in pairs, they are more likely to be streptococcus. Then you have GNB that are there in the background, that is pseudomonas. GPC in groups is Staph aureus. And GPB, this is atypical mycobacteria. So we'll discuss about this uh, in the coming slides. So always remember gram negative organisms are difficult to identify in gram stain because they're lost in the background, unlike gram positive, which stand out. So whenever you have a smear negative thing, go back and look for gram negative organisms, especially if the, there is a rapid course of worsening in the case that you're seeing. So coming to the bacterial management for gram positive cocci, we prefer to use moxifloxin or gatifloxin along with the fortified antibiotic of our choice is cefazolin. We can also add levofloxin that has recently come into the market. Oral antibiotics, again, like uh, uh, antifungals, we give them only in case of deeper ulcers, endoexudates, limbal involvement, or such cases only. Gatifloxin ointment in the night cover we give along with symptomatic treatment like atropine analysis that we have already discussed. For gram-negative organisms, the drug of choice is tobramycin or gentamicin that is fortified. And here in bacterial keratitis, the role of steroids was studied in the SCUT study done by the Arvind group again. So here they have found it doesn't have any beneficial role in the final scarring or the vision recovery. But however, if you look into the detail, there is a particular subtype of pseudomonas that is very aggressive that will have a beneficial role with the addition of steroids. However, I will not profess the use of steroids until unless you are sure of it microbiologically. But just to keep you updated, if you know for sure it is pseudomonas, definitely steroids will have a role because as I've told you, the inflammatory component here is more than the infectious component. Again, cross-linking, again, our own DNB student has done her thesis on this, and she found that cross-linking has a beneficial role in bacterial keratitis. However, uh, most of them will not require it. As I've told you, most of the gram positives require with uh, antimicrobial therapy alone. If you need it, you can use it, but as of such, uh, it may not be required in most of our cases. Next, let us go to this uh, very menacing organism that is atypical mycobacteria. This has been an emerging infection, especially uh, specifically post LASIK. So this is so prevalent in post LASIK infections that if you see in 100 cases, 50% of post LASIK infections are caused by atypical mycobacteria. And they can also be seen in immunocompromised patients otherwise. Why it is difficult to treat is, it is both a diagnostic and a therapeutic challenge for all of us. And the typical appearance, what you see here is this cracked windshield appearance that you can see with atypical mycobacteria. And the problem is it mimics both fungal and viral keratitis as you can see here. So most of the times when we don't know what we are looking at and we miss out on the microbiology, we treat it as viral, we treat it as fungal. That is how it takes longer time to heal. Why is it a diagnostic challenge? So if you carefully look at this picture on your left, you can see this white lesions that are there in the center. This phenomenon is called as negative stain. So this atypical mycobacteria is known for negative staining. It does not take any stain because of the large amount of lipids that are layer in the cell walls. So if you use special stains like Gill Nielsen, then they will stand out like this in the background. So this is again like gram-negative bacilli. It is very, very easy to miss on a smear. 
So if you see here and just go through it, you'll be not seeing anything. You have to look specifically for negative staining feature in atypical mycobacteria that is very, very common after LASIK uh, infections. And the treatment for mycobacteria is topical emicacin. Either you can use start 2%. If it is not responding, you can fortify it to 4%. Along with it, you can give a fluoroquinolone. Ejithromycin orally on day one, you can give 500 milligrams followed by 250 mg for three days. And uh, you should wait at least for one month for this medical therapy to heal because I've told you this is a very menacing organism. It will take some time to heal. If it doesn't heal with medical therapy for one month, you have no choice but to go ahead with a LASIK flap amputation. And if it even doesn't I mean, uh, get healed with that, you have to go in for a therapeutic graft. So that finishes the atypical microbacteria. Next, we have acanthamoeba keratitis. This is a typical ring infiltrate that you can see. And these are the enlarged corneal nerves, pathognomic of perineuritis that causes intense pain in the patient. And also in chronic cases, like in the third picture, you can see this chronic uh, corneal melting. So intense pain, ring infiltrate, and corneal melting in long-standing cases are pathognomic features of acanthamoeba keratitis. The usually contact lens users are also at risk of developing this disease. So this is how acanthamoeba cysts will look like in a KOH wet mount. And these are the acanthamoeba cysts in in vivo confocal microscopy. And the treatment of choice for acanthamoeba keratitis is PHMB or chlorhexidine point not 2% drops one hourly. The problem is they are not available commercially. PHMB is nothing but a swimming pool disinfectant, which usually we get it from the US whenever we go. And that stock solution comes for almost two years. In India, like we have the stock solution at our institute, Sri Kiran, LV Prasad, and in Tamil Nadu at Aravind. So whenever uh, surgeons ask, we send the stock solution to them. And there they titrate it with help of a micro pipette and reconstitute and give it to the patient. Here, the pain management is not... Uh, easy. It won't be, the pain here will not be amenable to regular analgesics. So here you have to take use of emitriptyline, 25 mg, DD or TID to control the pain. So here you have to give antimicrobials like PHMB or chlorhexidine at least for two weeks. Some people also add voriconazole to it. And then acanthamoeba, there are certain conditions in which you have to start steroids. Those conditions are when you see vascularization, when there is melting, when there is scleritis, lid edema, and the patient is very symptomatic. These are the five things when you have to start giving steroids to the patient after initiating the antimicrobial therapy. In these cases are known to take longer time to heal. Usually they take two to three months. If they're not healing. Then you can try a therapeutic DALC or TPK here again. It is a chronic disease. So be careful that the chronic uh, surface toxicity should not cover and mimic the original disease that is below it. Then we have nocardia keratitis. So nocardia, again, as I've told you, is a filamentous bacteria. Here you can see this typical wreath-shaped pattern. And in our experience, we also see them in most of the tunnel infiltrates that can lead to endophthalmitis. So if you see this ring infiltrate, this is of acanthamoeba. It's more or less, it's a continuous ring. Whereas in nocardia, it is a discontinuous wreath-shaped pattern that you have to differentiate clinically to know it is nocardia. And nocardia usually will be superficial. It does not go deep. It will spread more in the superficial plane than going into the deeper plane. So nocardia, as I've told you again, it is a filamentous bacteria. Here you can see the slender filamentous bacteria in gram stain and they're dot-like filaments. You should never confuse them with fungal filaments that you see here. They're more broader, they have septae. Here they're more just dot-like connections that you see, and it's a filamentous bacteria. And again, when you should not confuse it with pythium, which is more broader and ribbon-like with lesser septae. So this is how you can differentiate them on microbiology. So nocardia keratitis, the treatment again here is emicacin, like atypical mycobacteria along with the fourth generation fluoroquinolone. Systemically, we tend to give emicacin injection also if the lesions are uh, more limbal or tunnel infiltrates. And uh, orally, we can give sulfamethazole to trimethoprim combination in these cases. 
and uh, most of the cases 72% of 70% of the cases heal well with medical management and some of them may require uh, surgical intervention finally microsporidial keratitis you can see this microsporidial keratitis a score stuck on appearance that are typical and uh, the stromal form you see rarely and the stromal form is associated mostly with immunocompromised individuals whereas microsporidial keratitis you see with healthy individuals they usually give you a history of having a bath in the pond or getting exposed in the rain water or something like that so microsporidia again they are grain like lesions where you can easily appreciate in gram stain and with fluorescein uh, microscopy uh, you can easily see this gra grain like lesions in the essay so microsporidial keratitis management here you can see this beautiful picture taken by one of our fellows dr abilash uh, these are all the lesions microsporidial lesions the script, typical stuck on appearance so with just help of a moist cotton tip you apply some topical anesthesia and you can see how beautifully immediately after he has removed all those lesions how clear the cornea looks so here again the organism is more towards fungus so we prefer to give fluconazole or voriconazole drops and in the night cover you can give itraconazole i ointment or gatifloxacin i ointment stromal keratitis is very difficult to treat it will not heal to medical therapy and as i have told you it is seen mostly in immunocompromised patients and it will require a therapeutic graft that again has more higher chances of recurrence and a poorer prognosis so finally let us wrap it off with hsv epithelial keratitis so hsv epithelial keratitis uh, is the epithelial lesion is the active replicating virus and it is the infectious phase so when you see these lesions uh, slowly they coalesce to form a geographic ulcer so when this happens you have to differentiate it with other forms of dendrites one is the early fungal thing that we have discussed earlier this is the hzv dendrite very rarely you get to see a hzv dendrite when hzv dendrite occurs in isolation with no skin involvement the the uh, thing is called as zoster sign herpete so how do you differentiate it so it is more epithelial it will not have any central ulcer or terminal bulbs when you see here there are terminal bulbs and central ulceration in hzv there will be no terminal bulbs or central ulceration it is just like a struck on appearance like you see in microsporidia so here just scraping will do debridement will do there is no role for antivirals and uh, so in hsv epithelial keratitis the treatment is if you leave it also if it is a single uh dendrite if you leave it also it will usually heal spontaneously but whenever it is multiple make sure that the patient is not immunocompromised or diabetic and treat it aggressively so our treatment of choice for this is gancyclovir i ointment five times a day for two weeks and after two weeks also if it is not healing then we have to make sure that we are treating a wrong condition either it could be hzv or it could be some other acanthamoeba or fungal keratitis that is mimicking a viral keratitis so whenever you are giving gancyclovir i ointment five times a day for two weeks and the dendrite is not healing then 90% of the time you are not looking at hsv epithelial keratitis go back and look at the lesion again and try to look for differential diagnosis so more than two weeks we don't profess the use of uh, uh, gancyclovir i ointment however you can give oral acyclovir 400 mg bd or antivirals topical antivirals like glancyclovir once in the night debridement also is a good thing the most important thing is never use steroids in hsv epithelial keratitis next let us go to hsv stromal keratitis it has two forms necrotizing and non necrotizing in necrotizing there is an overlying epithelial defect with associated stromal melting here the viral and immune mediated destruction is there so the antivirals also have a role whereas in the non necrotizing part it is purely an immune interstitial disease and here only steroids will help you find it and in, in the endothelial form again you have two forms the diskiform keratitis and the diffuse form in both these things topical steroids and antiviral roles have a play in endotheritis is associated with uh, uh, iop rise that can be because of trabeculitis so hsv 
B wise layer wise. So when it is an epithelial disease and when you see dendritic and geographic ulcer, there is no role for steroid, only antivirals and debridement. When there is stromal keratitis without ulceration, then you give topical steroid and oral antiviral as prophylaxis. When it is stromal keratitis with ulceration, you give oral antiviral in therapeutic dose and topical steroids also. I'll tell you the difference between therapeutic dose and prophylactic dose in the coming slides. In endothelial keratitis, again, oral antiviral in therapeutic dose and topical steroids. So this is what therapeutic dose of acyclovir is 400 mg three to four times a day. And in children, it becomes divided and prophylactic dose is only twice a day. So therapeutic dose is 400 mg five times, whereas prophylactic is 400 mg PD. And gancyclovir eye ointment is five times a day. And we prefer to give instead of prophylactic dose, gancyclovir eye ointment as nighttime application also. This can be used alternatively. So when does HSV reactivate? This is one of the important thing again. So whenever you see a recurrent HSV keratitis, some of these features can be elicited with a proper history. The patient must have undergone stress in the recent history, or there is prolonged exposure to sun. There could be fever, trauma to body such as injury or surgery, or during menstruation, or certain medications, and even cross-linking can cause reactivation of HSV keratitis. So HSV and HZV differentiation we have already seen. There will be obvious skin lesions that will be there in HZV. And the epithelial disease, it's very easy to differentiate as I've shown you in the previous pictures. And stromal and endothelial diseases are however difficult, but however, luckily the treatment is same. So whenever in doubt, you use the VZV treatment, that is 800 mg BD acyclovir five times instead of 400 mg and give the treatment for VZV instead of HZV. So polymicrobial, we rarely see. And if you see here the growth, this is the fungal growth and this is the bacterial growth seen on blood agar. So this is a true polymicrobial, it's not contamination. So usually it will be fungal first, followed by the super infection from bacteria. It can be a combination of any organism, but we see uh, polymicrobials in less, less than 5% in all of our cases. So just to sum it up, so if it is fungus, fusarium, Feathery margins, the lesions are anterior stromal, branching at 90 degrees, and the treatment of choice is natamycin. If it is aspergillus, the lesions are deeper with endoexidates, and in the branching is dichotomous at 45 degrees. Here you can add oriconsole and also systemic antifungals. If it is dermatitious fungus, it is superficial, pigmented, and carpet like. The growth is also pigmented and the treatment of choice is therapeutic debridement with antifungals. Next, coming to bacteria, gram-positive are usually well-defined and superficial. They're usually GPC seen in pairs, chains, or groups. The treatment of choice is cefazolin, levofloxin, moxifloxin, or gatifloxin of higher strength. Gram-negative, there is rapid course and corneal melting. You have to identify carefully in the background. The treatment of choice is Tobra and Genta. Once the microbiologic is confirmed, there will be a role of topical steroids in gram-negative organ. Atypical microbacteria, the typical appearance is cracked windshield. It is negative staining that is more important in microbiology. And the drug of choice is emicacin with oral azithromycin. Whereas acanthamoeba, it is ring infiltrate with perineuritis. And here pain management is important. You can see cysts in KOH wet mouth. And the treatment of choice is PHMB with chlorohexidine with proper pain management. Nocardia, again, is a wreath-shaped infiltrate, filamentous bacteria. The drug of choice, again, is emicacin. Microsporidial is stuck on appearance of SPKs and cores and grain-like structures in microscopy. And the therapeutic debridement with fluconazole will yield beautiful results. So now let us go to the post-test answers and let us see how much knowledge you have gained through this course. So the first question again, over-the-counter steroids are the most common cause for bacterial keratitis, allergic conjunctivitis, fungal keratitis, both B and C. That's excellent. Almost 75% of you have answered it right. So that's a 15% improvement from your pre-test. 
the second question which bacterial organism causes rapid progression and corneal melting staphylococcus pseudomonas streptococcus nocardia excellent 91% of you have answered it right congratulations next go to the next question when should we refer a case to our corneal colleague for referral in case of fungal uh, microbial keratitis when the ulcer size is more than 3 when the ulcers are central in the visual axis one eyed patients and children all of the above excellent 92% of you have answered the question right that's good now let us go to the fourth question what is the indication for therapeutic keratoplasty impending corneal perforation limbal involvement deep stromal stromal ulcers not responding to maximal medical therapy all of the above excellent 88% of you have answered this correct that's a good improvement from the pre test let's go to the final question steroid should be avoided in which form of viral keratitis non necrotizing stromal disciform endothelitis epithelial disease a and b excellent 82% of you have answered the question right that's a considerable improvement from the pre test thank you for your attention so the take home message from my lecture today is microbial keratitis if you examine carefully 60% can be diagnosed by meticulous clinical examination that is clinical classical features and history try empirical therapy for not more than 5 days or 1 week if it is not responding try to go back and look at the ulcer or refer it to a center where they have microbiological backup when there is no signs of resolution and as i have already told you when the ulcer is central more than 2 mm if the patient is a child or one eyed patient never hesitate to refer them to a corneal surgeon the most important thing is all of you start this antibiotics and antifungals very promptly that the problem comes with dosing you only give them four times or five times or six times no you have to give them half hourly or one hourly if possible a loading dose in your clinic that dr ms sir has taught us he always puts the first drop of antibiotic or antifungal in the clinic itself so that the drug will start acting you can do a loading dose thing and then take it to half an hour one hour and then continue it of one hour in the waking period and night time you can give a cover next is maximal medical therapy when you do it for 2 to 3 weeks don't delay it further then you go in for the surgical intervention before if you let it delay and go into a corneal perforation or limbal involvement the outcomes of therapeutic graft in such scenarios will be worse as i have told you with our colleagues sivaram krishna study next invest in a glut clinical microscope thank you so much for your uh, time this uh, evening and i am greatly indebted to my teachers dr ms sir and prajna sir for uh, helping me gain this knowledge with their experience and i'm also grateful for my to my dad dr uv raman raj garu and my mentor dr yash chandrashekar sir for making me what i am today it is all because of the great platform that have give, he has given me in the sri kiran institute of ophthalmology and i also thank my cornea team and if you have any interesting or difficult cases please feel free to share them at idoctormadhu@gmail.com we and our team will be more than happy to look at the clinical photos and then look at the history and give our opinion with our collective and limited experience that we are having in this area thank you once again for your uh, kind attention uh, last but not the least thank you lawrence for taking care of the wonderful coordination and uh, making this uh, webinar a beautiful thing so before we go into the questions by panelists these are some of the questions that are asked by pre registered delegates let us finish them off before we go to the questions so the common questions they were asking were when do you use steroids in infectious keratitis so in bacterial keratitis as i've told you if you have a microbiological confirmation in pseudomonas it definitely has a role but as a general ophthalmologist i would not advise you to start steroids until unless you are having a microbiological evidence of it next in acanthamoeba as i have told you when there is vascularization scleritis pain lidedema 
congestion. There is definitely role of uh, topical steroids. Some people also tend to give systemic steroids in these cases. In viral cases, it is non-necrotizing stomal keratitis, pneumular keratitis, and endothelitis are the cases in which we can use safely use steroids. Never, never use steroids in fungal, nocardial, viral epithelial, or in cases where you don't have a microbiological evidence of what the organism is. And the nowadays we are having some alternative to steroids also, like tacrolimus and cyclosporins. These can be used for its anti-inflammatory properties in all the antimicrobial. Uh, along with all the antimicrobial agents in ulcers. Next, how do you differentiate between viral SPKs and microsporidial SPKs? So as I've told you, if you see the picture above is microsporidial SPK, the picture below is viral SPK. So here the lesions are more pinpoint there. And if you see closely, there is some amount of underlying stromal haze. And there are also less in number when compared to this struck on appearance coarser SPKs. And when you put a high magnification slit lamp, these will be raised over the surface, microsporidial SPKs. Viral SPKs will be almost in the plane of the surface. So that is how you can differentiate with history also, as I've told you, there'll be history of some water contamination in case of microsporidial. And conjunctivitis is more common in viral SPKs. So next, you have asked me about contact lens induced keratitis. So contact lens induced keratitis is again commonly caused by Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus because in all the contact lens users, the innate defense mechanism of cornea is lost and they're more prone to corneal infections than normal individuals. Rarely acanthamoeba and fungal can cause. Usually the source of infection is contamination of solution or the container or improper hygiene. So always along with the cultures, when you send for these organisms, send the contact lens and solution also for microbiological evaluation and discontinue contact lens in cases where you have seen such kind of infection so that you don't want to put the patient into further risk. Finally, it is marginal keratitis, though it is not a form of infectious keratitis. Most of the attendees have asked me to explain about this. So this is, as I've told you, it is non-infectious. It is an inflammatory or immune response to staphylococcal MAD antigen. So this usually has an underlying cause in mebomitis or blepharitis. The mainstay of treatment here is steroids. Differentiate it from PUK and murine ulcers. And until unless you treat the underlying cause, this condition will not be healed totally. Next is conjunctival hooding or Gunderson flap. Most of you have asked me regarding this. So this is again a great savior, especially in this COVID times. A lot of eyes were saved with this procedure and it's purely a tectonic procedure. The problem with this procedure is the future optical graft, if you really want to do, it will really have a high risk of rejection because of the vascularization that is present throughout the bed. K-Pro can be a viable option for visual restoration in these kind of cases. However, all of us should be knowing this simple technique that saves eyes when the tissues are not available. So I think uh, now we'll take questions from the attendees. So the first question is clinically suspect a fungal load antibacterial first or load antifungal or in combination any specific in this scenario. Sir, if you are clinically sure that it's classically looking like a fungal ulcer, it is better to give antifungals and look for response for 48 hours. If it is re responding only with antifungals alone, go ahead. If it is not responding, then add antibiotics. Look at the classical presentation. If it is well-defined, give only antibiotic. If you cannot differentiate, then only give both. But if you are able to clinically differentiate, give that specific therapy. Next question, how can we increase the gram stain and culture when we take in sample? That's a very relevant question. So when we do the scrapings, most of us, uh, especially fellows or postgraduate students, only scrape the surface. When you scrape the surface, you'll only get the slough. Slough will only have pus cells, but you'll not have any organisms. So what you have to do is you remove the slough, then go to the ulcer proper. And when you do the ulcer proper scraping, the yield will be more. You take it both from the center and the margins. So next question, do you still give steroids who underwent therapeutic corner for 
uncontrolled fungal keratitis. Yes, sir. Actually, in fungal keratitis, if it is a regular therapeutic graft, we do not give steroids. But if you intervene in these cases, like I have told you with our colleague Sivaram Krishna study, where when the ulcer is small, and when we do a 7.5-8 mm graft and use a good quality tissue, under close observation, you can definitely start steroids or tacrolimus or cyclosporin and retain this graft itself as an optical graft. Next is, can I do debridement by cotton tip? Cotton tip will not be of much use, sir. You should use a Kimura spatula or 15 number blade. How to manage resolved fungal keratitis with 4 mm pterygium, central corneal scarring, pupin, can pterygium be excised and beneficial? Yes, sir, you can always remove the pterygium and uh, it, it doesn't affect the fungal thing, not a problem. Do you fortified antibiotics? In details, please. Yes, I'll send you the details in the chat box. Important sign for atypical microbacteria. So atypical uh, micro, uh, mycobacteria, the thing as I've told you, 50% of the time is associated with LASIK infections. Otherwise, any long-standing infection, you are being treating that disease and for more than three weeks, four weeks, you are treating it and the ulcer is not responding. Then you have to go back and look for atypical mycobacteria repeat the scraping and look for negative uh, staining phenomena that I have told you. Then you can identify this organism. Can betadine be used for debridement? Yes, betadine can definitely be used and it's also very useful. What is the preferable choice in bacterial? Regular paracetamol works well in bacterial keratitis, sir. Only in cases of acanthamoeba, we need to give higher antibiotics like uh, Amitriptyline that I have told you. How long prophylactic treatment in herpes? Herpes, we usually continue the, uh, there are two doses, no? One is the therapeutic dose and prophylactic dose. Prophylactic dose, you can continue for almost three to six months. If it is going for a graft, you can continue uh, therapeutic dosage lifelong, especially if you're going for a corneal graft. Gabapentin for, uh, yeah, yeah, Gabapentin also you can use instead of emitriptyline. Definitely it works well. Yeah. Limbal involvement and indication for graft. Yes, definitely when there is a limbal involvement, you have to do a patch kind of graft that I've told, shown you in the videos. Indications for topicals versus oral antivirals in HSV. So if it is a frank infection, it is always better to give epithelial disease. We prefer topical. But if it is a prophylactic dosage, uh, in, you can go for two choices. One is either acyclovir 400 mg BD dosage or topical gancyclovir HS in the night. The choice is yours. You can use both. So how to recognize SPK from other SPK? Sir, I have already told you the microsporidial SPK will be more coarse and their stuck-on appearance will be there and there will be no underlying stromal haze. Whereas in viral SPK, they are more pinpointed. There will be some amount of underlying stromal haze. There will be lesser in number when you compare to microsporidial SPKs. How do you do loading in the clinic? Any of the antimicrobials, give it for every five minutes for half an hour or one hour. That is the loading time when the drug will reach its uh, MIC activity. From there, you can give it half an hourly or one hourly. Lid hygiene in corneal ulcers. Lid hygiene, uh, uh, it plays a role sometimes if the origin is because of that. Otherwise, as I have told you, the normal bacteria that are there in the lid will act against fungus. If it is a bacterial thing, anyway, with the antibacterials you are giving, it is going to heal. But you have to be careful in marginal keratitis where the lid hygiene is more important, where you see more mebomitis and blepharitis. There, the lid hygiene plays a role is more. Anti-glaucoma during, yes, anti-glaucoma should be given in all the cases that I've already told you. Povidin iodine drops in resistant cases. Uh, we have used in a few, but the results are not uh, very gratifying. Give antifungal in aspergillus. Sometimes aspergillus, deeper infections, we have to give as long as six or eight weeks, sir. For diagnosis, do you depend on clinical examination? Yes, most of the time on clinical examination. VZV, yes, sir, you can use steroids in VZV if it is a stromal or endothelial disease. 
despite uh, natamycin and uh, voriconazole that uh, it has healed. Probably, sir, you were looking at pythium. If you see and go back, the diagnosis may be wrong, or sometimes even with best medical therapy, they can perforate. You cannot have a particular reason to it. Maybe from next time, you can try adding doxycycline to prevent uh, perforations, which works well in our experience. Yeah, so Sujit Kumar Biswas, my friend from Bangladesh, has asked a question. If there is a huge exudate, do you feel that you should uh, uh, remove this exudate? Sir, actually, it's very tempting when you see these large exudates and hypopions, it is very tempting for us to go inside and evacuate it. But in our experience, what we have seen is, at least in 70% of the cases, it comes back with a bang. You'll have more endoexudate, more reaction, so in these cases, I think it's uh, especially when it is large endoexudates, you can better go in for a uh, therapeutic graft itself, sir. Fungal keratitis causing fungal endophthalmitis is very rare. Uh, usually if they cause is end of post endophthalmitis, if the contaminating thing is fungal only, you get fungal endophthalmitis. And fungal endophthalmitis, the visual outcomes are very, very poor. Viral SPKs with the, can we use steroids? Uh, viral SPKs usually get self-limited. Uh, if they transition into numular keratitis, then you can start using uh, steroids, Harika. Uh, uh, my father has asked me a question, whether it's acyclovir or gancyclovir. I prefer gancyclovir because it is in gel form and less toxic. I think that should be better when compared to a cyclovir topical form. Yeah. So I think uh, we have answered most of the questions. If I've left any of the questions, I'll definitely answer in the box and you can have a look at them.